this okay. it's, it's like 92 participants now so i think yeah i think you can start it's fine okay yep okay so this is uh, the hands-on on the transport module so we're going to look at um well basically two exercises. the first one will be on trying to compute the electric resistivity of lead using both the Zeeman formula and the Boltzmann transport equation. So I've already shown the um, result for the Boltzmann transport equation, both in the CERTA and the uh, iterative one uh, on this plot. But there is actually a sort of uh, even more approximated way to compute the resistivity. And this is called the Zeeman formula. Uh, and this rests on the uh, lowest order variational approximation, also called LOVA. And in that approximation, you basically start from the CERTA Boltzmann transport equation, and then you do additional approximation. Um, so you approximate, you, you're saying that the uh, energy resolved decay function is basically evaluated at the Fermi level. So this is a metal. Um, you approximate the change of the Fermi Dirac distribution function as a function of uh, eigen energies. And th this is in principle an analytical huh? because you can do the derivative and then you obtain one over KBT F, uh, you know, F0, one minus F, uh, this is exact, but you can approximate this and this um, helps. I mean, then, then you can have a nice formulation. You also need to use the fact that the uh, scattering rate is isotropic. And basically, there is a derivation in this uh, in this review uh, where it, it's clearly shown how to go from the CERTA to, to the LOVA. And if you do that, then you end up with this equation. Um, so the resistivity, you can see here, it's uh, inversely proportional with uh, temperature. And then you have this integral. And what is nice is that here you have this transport Eliasberg um, spectral function. And that will be discussed, not the transport one, but the alpha square f um, Eliasberg function will be discussed uh, on Thursday by, by Roxana Margin uh, when she will discuss uh, superconductivity. So this is closely sort of linked with superconductivity. The only difference uh, is that this equation is, is written um, as basically the phone frequency times the mode resolved transport uh, coupling strength. And this is the same coupling strength as the one you would use in superconductivity, with the only difference being this velocity factor. And this is what makes it the transport one in a way. Um, and so in order to compute that uh, spectral function, you need to perform uh, this integral over the uh, electron phonon matrix element uh, over the, the surface. And so you might wonder, oh, okay, but then why, I mean, why not solving the Boltzmann transport equation if, since it's more accurate? Well, the reason is simply that you, it might happen that either experimentally or because you have a model or something like that, you are able to sort of describe that uh, function where the uh, integral is already performed. Uh, and then if you have somehow a uh, alpha square f depending on frequency, for whatever reason, then you can have a quite nice estimation of the resistivity. Uh, and you can see this is just a frequency integral and that's it. So this is very fast. Um, so that might be one of the reasons why you would want to use the Zeeman formula. Uh, you can notice here there is an N and this is the number of electron per unit volume. And so in the case of uh, uh, lead, which is the one we're gonna study today, um, you have four electrons that contribute to the transport but you have, eight, you know, you have eight electron on the outer shell. Uh, and so in an earlier version of um, EPW from the last school, we actually used eight, but um, we, we believe that actually it should be four. So that was a, a mistake. Um, so now I'm gonna show you how to compute the Zeeman formula within uh, EPW. And so for each of those elements in the formula, I will point towards uh, input variables in the in the EPW code, uh, so you can of course download the, the hands-on and and all of that will be explained. But so that you can connect it to the formula, I'm just showing it now. So n is the number of electrons that contribute to the mobility, n is defined with this nc parameter. So for example, in lead is four, but it depends on the material. Um, this transport alpha square f. In order to obtain it, you need to put the the phonon self energy calculation to true and the alpha square f to true as well, and then this will produce the um, spectral function and the uh, phonon self-energy. 
Um, so now, if we look at how to obtain the uh, Eliasberg spectral function, you can see that we have uh, this uh, mode resolved transport uh, coupling strength. Um, and this is defined uh, like I showed before. So this is actually the, the most general definition. Uh, but if we use what is called the delta approximation, we can show that uh, actually those um, reduce to this. Uh, and so you, you only have Dirac delta around the Fermi level uh, of, of a metal. Uh, and so this tilde approximation is triggered when you put this to true. If this is not true, then you, you uh, EPW will calculate this explicitly. Um, the only thing I should mention is that this is less stable. So somehow this converge uh, slower. So you need much denser grid uh, and smaller delta and smaller broadening in order to converge that. Whereas the delta approximation is, is um, better behave somehow. It's more approximate, but it's better behave. So um, in the, in the hands-on, we're gonna use it. Um, then this uh, Dirac delta that you see here, those are defined by the input variable D goes W, and it's simply uh, the, the, the width in uh, EV, so the open one EV in this case, uh, for the Gaussian delta that you see here. Uh, what is important is that you have another Gaussian delta here, uh, but you, you can see that here, this is a Gaussian delta on the electronic um, eigenstate, whereas the delta that we have here, it's on the phonon frequency. Uh, and therefore, we have a different uh, input variable. We have this D goes Q. Uh, and so typically, this is a bit smaller than the D goes W. So for example, here, the 0.05 EV. Um, now, uh, here in the denominator, you can see that we have uh, this. This is the density of state at the Fermi level. Um, <clears throat> And so in the case of metal, you, you put the input variable assume metal. And what it will do is that it will compute this density of state using a Fermi Dirac distribution function. Um, and in that case, you need, so there are different ways to compute the DOS, but this is the most logical one is to use the Fermi Dirac distribution function. Uh, and so in that case, you need to use N goes minus 99. This is from quantum espresso. And this means that you want to do a Fermi Dirac distribution. And therefore, the temperature that you put in the calculation times uh, one, this is one Kelvin, this only impacts this object. Uh, and, and also the determination of the Fermi level. So the Fermi level that you see here and this, that will be computed uh, using the temperature that you give here. Uh, and so the temperature should be such that basically the metal is, is converged within this uh, Fermi Dirac distribution function of the calculation of the DOS. Um, however, when we're going to compute the conductivity, you can see that you have a temperature here. So the temp that you put in the input is not the temp that you have here. So what the code will do is it will use this temp just to compute that. And then at the end, this is really a post-processing tool. At the end, EPW will just output all the resistivity for uh, you know, temperature ranging from 1 to 1,000 by default. Uh, if you want to change it, you will need to hack the code. There is no input variable to change this at the moment. If you think it's important, we can also change that maybe. Uh, but the, the only thing that could be confusing is that you really be, need to be careful that temps here does not mean the temperature in the previous formula. Whereas when you do the Boltzmann transport equation, this input variable, temps, that's really the, the phononic temperature. So the, here it's more the electronic temperature. Um, and finally, you have this uh, velocity. Uh, that you can see here. And so if you put velocity one year, so we have changed this input variable before it was true. So before VME true is exactly the same as VME one year. So this is the velocity computed using uh, the one year approach. Um, however, we have now another way which you can call dipole, VME equals dipole. And in that case, this is what I mentioned during the lecture uh, to the question of uh, Joe, Joe Law, um, is the fact that if you put dipole, then um, this is another way to compute the, the velocity um, using the dipole and the non-local part of the potential and, and the position operator. Now, in this, uh, I mean, in this exercise, we're going to use one year, but you can try to play with it and see if it gives the same result. So at convergence, it should give the same result. Um, OK, and so this is the first way that we're going to try to compute the resistivity of lead. And then the second way will be using the Boltzmann transport equation. 
so this is a reminder of what we just saw, uh, saw uh, you know, one hour and a half ago. Uh, so we're going to try to compute the conductivity uh, using the Boltzmann transport equation. So uh, as a reminder, this is the drift mobility. This is the Boltzmann iterative Boltzmann transport equation. Again, this is the scattering rate. Um, <clears throat> and so to compute the resistivity of the of metal, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the conductivity, and then it will compute the inverse. Uh, the inverse of the conductivity will be, of course, the resistivity. And so if you put the tag in EPW assume metal true, then the code will also give you not only the conductivity, but it will also give you the resistivity in a file. Um, yeah, so this is just to show. The, now, now I will uh, detail what are the input parameters of EPW that govern the drift conductivity. Uh, of course, it's very similar parameter when you want to do the mobility of a semiconductor. So for the drift conductivity, we want to compute uh, this change of uh, occupation with respect to field. And this is uh, an equation that we need to solve self consistently. And so if you put int mob to true, this tells the code to compute the drift mobility and also the conductivity. In fact, the code computes the conductivity and then divide to get the, the mobility. If you put iterative BT to true, then the code will do it iteratively. So it will solve um, basically this uh, Boltzmann transport equation, and it will also report the, the certa value. So I would say, yeah, I mean, basically, you should always put it to true. You can put it to false, then it's only the certa. But because of the way the code is uh, written, basically, all the scattering rate are first computed. And then the iterative solution is done. But th this uh, iterative solution is actually extremely fast. So what really takes a lot of time is the computation of the scattering rate and the computation of the transition probability, which is this object. And so I would say 99% of the case, people should always do iterative Boltzmann to get both, basically. Um, and the iterative solution will can be done with a uh, Broyden linear mixing. Uh, in this case, I have put 0 0.7. What does it mean? It means we take um, basically 0 0.7 of the new solution and 0 0.3 from the previous solution. But of course, this can change. If you put it to 1, it means you have no mixing, basically. Um, and the code, the iteration will stop after mob max iter has been uh, reached. So in this case, 200. Um, typically, it converges faster, but yeah. So if you have an issue in your calculation, maybe this will never converge. And therefore, it's important to have a maximum iteration number. But there is a default value of 300 if you don't specify it. Um, then you want to perform this k-point integral in this q-point integral. Um, so you can use uh, crystal symmetries to speed up the calculation. And for that, you need to use this MP, MP mesh k a keyword, which is also used in the superconductivity module. And so this will use crystal symmetry on the fine k point. So as Yun Jun uh, mentioned yesterday, um, there is a slight issue, which is that technically the one function are not guaranteed to respect crystal symmetry. And therefore, this might uh, then not be full, fully fulfilled. And so if you use it, the code will let you use it. But it could be that you don't get exactly the same result as if you don't use crystal symmetry. So it's typically a good idea to try putting this to true and to false and to, to make sure that the results are closed. So you don't expect perfect agreement, again, because the one function are not necessarily fully symmetric. Uh, but if, if you are, you know, your decay is well converged, if the system you know, is, is well converged, in principle, the number should be quite close. And if they are, then it's sort of good practice to use it because it can really, really speed up the calculation. So in the semiconductor that I showed um, before, uh, those are very high symmetric materials. Therefore, you can get you know, over an order of magnitude less k point to compute. So it's quite important, let's say. Um, now, yeah, for both the k point and the q point, um, you can reduce the computational cost by considering only the state that have uh, negative energy, which are 0 0.4, in this case, 0 0.4 EV uh, around the Fermi level. So it's a, it's a F stick, it's an uh, uh, energy window around the Fermi level on which you compute explicitly the interpolated matrix element. Um, and as I mentioned, in the case of transport, 
um, all the states that are relatively far from the band edge, they have zero contribution. And the reason is because of such term. So this term, if you analytically uh, you know, derive it, you will see that this is F times one minus F zero. And so this will be non-zero only if you have fractional occupation. So this is really at the band edge where the occupation is, is fractional. If you have either zero occupation or one occupation, this will be completely zero. Uh, and so a typical value of 0 0.3 EV within the band edge is typically enough, but you should perform a convergence to make sure that this has no impact. Um, be careful that this F stick is with respect to the Fermi level. Uh, so this is not with respect to the band edge. And so, for example, if your Fermi level is 0 0.1 EV above the, let's say, valence band maximum, then you need to put 0 0.4 in order to include all the state 0 0.3 EV below the valence band. Okay. So you, you, this is just important to, to understand. And I will show you when we run that in the output, uh, it's very clear which, which uh, energy state are included. So you need to pay attention to the output to make sure that you include the state that you want. Um, yeah, finally, there is an input called carrier. And this is the carrier concentration that you would like to do in the calculation. Now, this is only useful for semiconductor. So in semiconductor, if you're doing intrinsic, maybe you want 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, something like that, carrier concentration in centimeter um, min minus three. However, because here we are in a metal, we, we do not dope. We, we, I mean, the carrier concentration cannot be imposed. It depends on the band structure and you know, the dots. And so if you're doing a metal, you have to put carrier to fault. Okay. Um, okay. Then uh, there is also an, an input which is called restart. And if you put this to true, what it will do is that when the calculation is going, so the calculation is parallelized over k point, but it's uh, sequential on q point. So it will do q point by q point. Uh, there is a loop over it, and it will do all the q points within the f, the f stick. And uh, this can be relatively long, and therefore it's good to put restart true. And then basically every restart step that you put, so you can put 50, for example, or you can put 100, every 100 uh, fine interpolated Q points, it will write to this restart point, such that if your calculation crash because of time limit or whatever, the code will uh, automatically restart. Basically, it will produce a file called restart.fmt, and the code will automatically restart from that without asking you anything. If it detects the file, it will restart from there. Now, you need to be careful as well, because if you start changing the input in a way that is not consistent with your previous calculation, and you are still in the same folder, and you have uh, you know, a restart.fmt file present, then you, you might have issue. In that case, you need to remove the file and relaunch the calculation if you want to stay in the same folder. Um, there is also another one which is called select Q read. And so this input is simply to write to disk to a small file called select.fmt. It will write the list of Q points that are within the F stick. The reason for that is that in, if the grid is very, very dense, it could be that it takes some time for the code to just figure out or compute which uh, Q points are within the F stick. And so maybe you don't want to have to, to redo it every time if you have a crash. So uh, you can put it to, if you put it to, to false, it will produce the file. But then if you do a restart, you can put it to true and then it will read this one. Uh, and of course the code will crash if you put it to true, but the, the file doesn't exist. Uh, finally, I want to mention that um, both uh, the boson chain distribution function, the Fermi-Dirac distribution function and the scattering rate, and of course uh, those um, DF, all depend on temperature through this input variable temp. And so you can, it's like quite flexible. You can either specify all the temperatures, so you can put the 50, 25, they don't need to be equally spaced. You can put whatever list you want, or you can put uh, initial temperature, final temperature, and number of temperatures in between. So in this case, this means we're gonna have nine temperature in total between 100 Kelvin and 500 Kelvin. So there are two ways to, but in this case, it's of course, uh, uh, equally spaced. So if you want non-equally spaced temperature, then you have to put it by hand, uh, you know, different one. Um, now for the uh, broadening, so the for the delta Dirac that you see here, you can use adaptive broadening, and this is triggered if you put d goes to zero. If you put it to a finite value, even small, like 0, 0.0, like one milliev, say, in that case it will use fixed Gaussian smearing. If you put it to zero, it will use adaptive broadening. 
so this I showed during the, the talk, but it's just a reminder. So this is how the uh, width of the Gaussian is calculated. So you will have a different width for each of the uh, K points and each of the states will have a different uh, Gaussian width. And in the code, you will see uh, the code will report the maximum and minimum value of the broadening. And so this will give you a, an, an idea of uh, how big your uh, adaptive broadening is uh, in milliv. Okay, so this is exercise one. Um, and I, mean, I will also present exercise two now because uh, we've decided to put the recording for those. So uh, that way it's self-contained. Uh, and then I will, I will stop and then I will go with you through the exercise uh, on Frontera. So for the exercise two, we are basically going to compute the uh, whole mobility of cubic boron nitride, as well as the whole factor, and therefore also as well as the whole mobility. So those are the converged value that I have shown um, in, the, in the talk, and you can also find them in this uh, archive paper. And so what we're gonna try to, we can basically we're gonna try to reproduce those plots. Of course, those are done on very dense grid, so we will do less dense grid, but then you can try to converge and try to reproduce those. So this is a, a log grid, and you can see that this is the drift uh, iterative solution, so without the whole factor, and then the green is the whole factor mobility. So, so actually, this is one of the few examples where the whole factor is uh, lower than one. So actually, in this case, the mobility decreases when you do the whole factor. Um, and this is the difference uh, of the whole factor with temperature. Um, if you use the CERTA or the iterative solution. Uh, so the iterative solution is close to one, whereas the CERTA is a bit smaller. Um, yeah, this is just, again, uh, a reminder of the whole mobility that I have presented. The only thing you need to know is that if you want to do a magnetic field calculation, um, the way it is done in EPW is through finite difference. And so basically this um, derivative is done here, is done by finite difference. And then the field, is uh, finite. So you can do finite field calculation. So you can do magneto transport um, calculation. The only caveat is again, the magnetic field cannot be too strong because you cannot describe Landau level. Um, and so the B that you find here, this is, input, it's, this is an input variable uh, called B field, uh, in this case, Z. So the idea is that you, you can put the B field along any uh, X, Y, Z Cartesian direction you want. So you have B field X, B field Y, B field Z. In principle, you can also use um, along X and Y and things like that, uh, but I wouldn't say that it's extremely tested. So I would more do it along one for now, let's say. And this is in Tesla. And so you can see in this, because we are interested in the whole factor and the whole mobility, and this is defined in the limit of zero field. Uh, so basically what we do is we have to do a conversion. So you have to decrease the field to zero. And in this case, we've already shown that 10 to the minus 10 Tesla is small enough, basically. Uh, but it's just to say that you, if you want, you can put finite value and you can study how the mobility change, for example, with field. Okay. Um, again, this is a bit technical. So this is how to correctly interpolate using the, you know, this long range limit, the Taylor expansion in terms of Q wave vector. Um, so the first is the dipole. Uh, to include the dipole, you need to put L polar to true in the input of EPW. And this will uh, then read automatically the Born effective charge and the dielectric constant from the phonon calculation that you will have to link. Um, now, if you want to also include quadrupole, you have to provide a file in a specific format, um, which have all the non-equivalent non uh, quadrupole tensor. So it basically contains the quadrupole tensor, and I will show um, what it looks like. And in this exercise, we provide you a sort of fake quadruple tensor. Um, at the moment, it's not possible to compute the quadruple tensor in the quantum espresso code. So the only two ways to compute the, the tensor and then to create this file is to either fit, uh, you know, electron from the matrix element or change of the potential yourself by hand with direct DFPD calculation and then try from that to deduce the value of the quadrupole. Uh, and this is what is done is in this uh, archive paper. Or you can use perturbation theory. And this has been implemented with some limitation in the Abinit code. So you can also use the Abinit code to give you an idea of what the quadrupole 
um, term, should, the value should be. Uh, we hope that uh, at some point it will be implemented also in the quantum espresso, and therefore we could directly read automatically the quadrupole from the phonon output, but it's not the case at present. Uh, so I will not um, explain or, or spend much time in this hands-on on explaining how to get the quadrupole. So the assumption is that you have the value of the quadrupole, either from literature or from abinet or whatever, and then the code will detect the file and will read it, and then it will perform the correct uh, interpolation. So here I have a few additional notes. Um, when you do this calculation, you have to give um, an initial value for the Fermi level. Um, so the way it is done is, I mean, EPW can compute the fine Fermi level, um, but in the transport module, because we want to compute the Fermi level, uh, we want to compute the F stick. Uh, from the Fermi level, in an energy window from the Fermi level, the recommended way is to compute electron and hole mobility separately. So you want to compute only the hole and only the electron. This will make the calculation much cheaper because then you have much less band. You basically winerize only the conduction band or only the valence band. And since the calculation costs scale as the number of winerized band square, it's much cheaper to do that. That's one way. And therefore, in that case, uh, the best is to specify the Fermi level within the band gap, typically close, but not completely at the band gap. So maybe 0 0.1 EV above, the, you know, above the, the valence band, for example, or below the conduction band. And then you provide an F stick, which includes state um, basically to, uh, as, as long as you, I mean, as deep as you want. The point is, if you put the Fermi level in the middle of the band gap, and then you put a very big F stick window, the problem is that you will include state both from the conduction and the valence, and that will make the calculation quite expensive. And so this is one way to treat them separately, which is the recommended way and the cheapest way to do it. So the suggestion is to, sell, to basically input a Fermi energy, 0 0.1 EV above the Fermi level, and this will be used to detect the state that you have to include in the calculation. Now, then for semiconductor, you can provide the carrier density that you want. And this is the target carrier density that you are asking the code to compute. So for example, if it's negative, this means that you want whole mobility. If it's positive, it means you want electron mobility. So, okay. So in this case, we want to do the whole mobility of cubic boron nitride. So we put N carrier to minus uh, 10 to the 13. So 10 to the 13 is the carrier concentration. And basically what this tells the code is to say, OK, you start from that Fermi level that, you, that I've be given you in the input. And then it will do a bisection method. And it will find the real position of the Fermi level such that the carrier concentration is 110 to the 13. And then the entire calculation, the entire transport calculation will be done with the Fermi level, which is automatically computed by EPW for that carrier level. So, so it's very important to understand that the Fermi energy that you give is not the one that will be used to do the transport calculation. It's the one that is used to define the uh, F-stick window, and is the one that is used to for an initial guess for this target um, concentration. So in the output, this should be clear because the, the code will report the carrier concentration used. It will report the F-stick window. It will report the state included and things like that. Um, just to mention, of course, if the carrier concentration is too low, then the problem is that the Fermi level will be really at the edge of touching the, 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 um, the, 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 the valence band or the conduction band. And this is a bit of an issue uh, for the stability of the code. And therefore, if the end carrier is below 110 to the 5, then the code, so it can be 0 or below that, then the code will understand that you want to do an intrinsic mobility calculation. So this is a different type of calculation. In that case, you don't specify the carrier density. And then what is happening is that the code will place the Fermi level in the middle of the band gap such that the carrier concentration of the electron and the hole is exactly the same. So it will not be exactly at the center. It will be a bit higher or, or low, depending if you can put more carrier in the conduction or the valence, depending on the shape of the carrier. And, uh, and once this level is determined, then the mobility calculation is done. But of course, in that case, you need to have both electron and hole. So you need to one uh, the conduction and the valence band, and the calculation will be more expensive. 
So the, again, the suggestion is to use the carrier and to do separately conduction and valence. Um, yeah, and just to mention that a reasonable carrier concentration for a 3D bulk semiconductor is between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 16. You can do more, there is no problem with that. Uh, in principle, the result should not change with carrier concentration, except if you, in, if you ask a very, very large carrier concentration, maybe 10 to the, I don't know, 25 or whatever, in that case, the code might not be able to find the Fermi level because it assumes that the Fermi level is within the band gap. And so it, it will not find the solution because for that carrier concentration, it might be that you need the Fermi level to be inside the band gap, uh, sorry, to be inside the conduction band or the valence band. And this is a different type of calculation, which like I uh, explained, if you do this type of calculation, you can. And in that case, you need to put the Fermi level inside the valence band of the conduction band. But then you need to be very careful because you have additional screening, then you need to rescreen your electron and this is a different type of calculation. So we'll not do that. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say. I will stop sharing 